because of the terrible evil. But their thinking is so illogical, one wonders at its acceptance. For an example, and this may be a terrible example, is it all right to mutilate babies for entertainment? I mean, everybody says no. But if there is no God and we all just evolved and we're all worthless molecules going nowhere, then who cares when bad thing happens? What would we expect? But since everyone recognizes that some things are wrong, we know that objective moral values do exist. Therefore, God must exist. Do you see what happens? Skeptics present a long list of horrific things, saying these are immoral, therefore there is no God. But to raise these issues as moral issues is to assume a state of affairs evolution cannot afford. So the skeptic denies objective moral values because to accept such a reality would be to allow for the possibility of God's existence. So they have to conclude that since there is no good, there is no such thing as evil either. Now, can you imagine how that conclusion works? Imagine somebody going to somebody who's lost their first grader in Newtown and saying, you know, what happened at Sandy Hook Elementary School really wasn't evil. I mean, come on, you and I know there's evil and trouble in the world. All Christians, I could say all people, must grapple with the reality of hard times. The Apostle Peter, the unquestioned leader among the 12 disciples of Jesus, addresses this issue in his letter called 1 Peter. If you'd like to turn with me, if you brought your Bible, you can. Uh, there are Bibles under all the seats, uh, if you want, and it's on page 1221. Writing from Rome sometime around 60 A.D., he wrote to Christians living in the Roman province of Asia, toward the east side of what we know as modern-day Turkey. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to God's elect, Exiles scattered throughout the provinces of Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. Uh, Nero was the emperor of Rome from 54 to 68 AD, and under his rule, things got worse and worse for Christians. Particularly after 64 AD, anybody who would not bow down and worship Nero, uh, any Christian was, uh, um, head was chopped off or they were fed to the lions. Well, this treatment in Rome spread to all the provinces throughout the Roman Empire, and, and Peter is writing to some of these people. Peter tells us in these opening verses that if we are to deal with persecution, suffering, and hard times, we must understand at least three things. First, understand that we are refugees in this world. Verse 1, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ to God's elect, exiles scattered throughout the provinces. He calls them exiles. They're foreigners. They are refugees. Our final home, this is not our final home, our real home is in heaven. We are just temporary residents or refugees in this world. Verse 2, who have been chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through the sanctifying work of the Spirit to be obedient to Jesus Christ and sprinkled with His blood, grace and peace be yours in abundance. As refugees, we are to be obedient to Jesus Christ. If you're dealing with difficult things, remember, this is not your permanent home. This is not all there is. This is not where all the rewards are given out. This is not where you're expected to find your greatest happiness. You might not even find happiness at all. Two, understand that the greatness of our salvation will make all suffering worth it. Verse three, praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is God's name throughout the New Testament. He is the, not just any God. He's the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In His great mercy, He has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. It's a new birth into a living hope because Jesus was raised from the dead. His resurrection is the centerpiece of the Christian faith. It's especially that for Peter, and he mentions it many times in this letter. 
Remember, Peter was the one that Jesus said to on the night uh, of his arrest, you will deny me three times before the night's over. Peter says, oh, (laughs) you can count on me, I won't do that. But sure enough, before the night was over, people had asked him three times, do you know Jesus? No, I don't know who he is. Then when it happened, he was so humiliated. Then when Jesus was crucified, he felt like he was responsible. He had let him down and he was crushed. But then Jesus rose from the dead. He visited Peter. Peter touched him. He cooked breakfast for Peter and he asked him three times, do you love me? Giving Peter a chance to do three do-overs. And then we read in Acts chapter 2 that Peter and all the disciples were filled with the Holy Spirit and Peter preached with such power that 3,000 people became believers on one day. What turned it around for Peter? The resurrection. Verse 4, and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you. It's an inheritance that can never fade. That makes all the hard times worth it. It's working for an inheritance that cannot be lost. Why spend all your life working for rewards that will only last a few years? Verse 5, who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. The salvation we experience of forgiveness of sins through Christ's death on the cross is only partial. We still face evil, heartbreaks, persecution and hard times. Our full salvation will be revealed when Jesus comes again. Verse 10, concerning this salvation, the prophets who spoke of the grace that was to come to you searched intently and with the greatest care trying to find out the time and circumstances to which the Spirit of Christ in them was pointing when he predicted the sufferings of the Messiah and the glories that would follow This salvation, the reconciliation of all human beings to God through Jesus' death on the cross was so magnificent, this this, uh, this, uh, salvation that would, uh, they they prophesied about a, uh, a Messiah who would suffer and then attain great glory. They didn't know when this would happen, but it was so great they spent their lifetimes searching for it. Verse 12, it was revealed to them. That they were not serving themselves, but you, when they spoke of the things that have now been told you by those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. Even angels long to look into these things. The salvation, the reconciliation of us to God is so magnificent that even angels like to talk about it and look into it. If you're not totally excited about your reconciliation with the God of the universe through Jesus Christ, then let the prophets and angels stir your excitement. When you find yourself overwhelmed by the difficulties and hard times you face, fix your mind on the greatness of the salvation you will one day obtain when Jesus comes. Verse 6, In all this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, You may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. Peter says, now for a little while, you may have had to suffer. He says, the suffering you face here in this life is just for a little while. Compared to eternity, it's a short time. All Christians must grapple with the reality of hard times. To do that, we need to understand that we are refugees in this world. This is not where we get all our happiness, where we should expect all happiness. And we must understand the greatness of the salvation we will one day obtain. And three, we must understand that suffering tests the genuineness of our faith. Verse 7, these have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith, of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor, when Jesus Christ is revealed. We will never know all the reasons God allows so much evil in this world, allows us to suffer. We might wonder why he doesn't just remove the evil. Why doesn't he protect us from suffering? Here Peter gives us at least one possible reason. He suggests he uses tough times to test our faith. He uses gold as an example. Gold is refined by fire to distinguish it from counterfeits. He says, how much more then should faith, 
which is far more valuable than gold, be tested? Who wants a faith that we abandon as soon as we get sick or someone dies or we lose our job or we face persecution? God wants to test our faith to make it strong. How many Christians do you know that think you, you think they really have a strong faith? Willow Creek commissioned a study called Reveal. In 2007, they interviewed uh, or surveyed 2,000 churches, 250,000 American Christians, to find out who really has a uh, Christ-centered faith. They divided Christians into four groups. One is beginning with Christ. These are people that maybe don't know Christ. They're just kind of looking into the faith, maybe have started. Second is growing with Christ. They have committed their lives to Christ. They're just kind of learning to go to church and how to read the Bible. Third is close to Christ. These are people that, you know, maybe been in the faith for a long time. They say, yeah, I'm close to Christ. He's very important to me. And the fourth category was Christ-centered. Their whole life is built around Jesus Christ. He's the reason they live. How many do you think they found were Christ-centered? 11%. That means 9 out of 10 Christians are chugging along on just part of their horsepower. They're saved but not empowered. I mean, what if a hospital only healed 11% of its patients? How about a builder who only completed 11% of his houses? How about a football team that only won 11% of their games? How about a school that only graduated 11% of its students? I mean, some serious changes would be made, right? I mean, the church has some serious deficiencies. But we also have a great opportunity. We figure about 2.2 billion people in the world are Christians. That's about one-third of the world's population. If the survey is right, that would mean about 2 billion of these Christians are only partly powered. They're lukewarm. What if 2 billion Christians got a tune-up? How much more joy would be shared in the world? How much hunger would be eliminated? How many wars would be stopped? How many orphanages would be built? How many orphanages would we even need? What would happen if you moved to a Christ-centered Christian? I mean, do you sense a a gap between who you want to be and who you are? The good news is you can narrow that gap and become the person you want to be and Christ wants you to be. But you can't become an 11 percenter on your own. You need the power of the Holy Spirit. Verse 8, though you have not seen him, Jesus Christ, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. For you are receiving the end result of your faith, the salvation of your souls. When you understand that your faith needs, to, in order to be genuine, has to be tested, then difficult times need not drive you away from God, but can actually draw you closer to love for Christ. All Christians must grapple with the reality of hard times. How are you responding to your hard times? Your suffering or persecution in your life? Are you angry with God? Are you disappointed in Him? Are you disillusioned? Are you weary? Hard times are part of God's plan for testing our faith and helping us grow. So let's accept them as part of His plan for our lives this year. In the midst of them, let's not turn away from God but turn toward him. Let's pray. Father, thank you for Peter writing to Christians who are suffering a lot of persecution.
probably tougher times than we're having. But I recognize a lot of us are facing all kinds of stuff and it shakes some of our faith. But I pray for everyone here that we would have a new perspective and realize that suffering is part of God's plan. That's, it's not a surprise. We, we look for it, we expect it, and it would draw us closer to you, not further away. I'd like to give you a minute to pray to God. If you've never committed your life to Jesus Christ, you could just say right now in your prayer, Jesus, I believe you're the Son of God. I believe you died for me and rose again. I'd like you in my life. Would you come in right now? If you've already made that commitment, maybe you want to tell him what you think about the tough times facing you and say, I recognize that they're part of your plan and I'm going to let them test my faith and draw me closer to you. So everybody pray. I'll give you a minute. Thank you, Father, for hearing our prayers and uh, forgive us for being surprised by suffering and uh, doubting our faith because of the tough things we face, but help us to draw nearer to you and depend on you and your Holy Spirit when we face tough times. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, would you take out your program, Standing Firm in Hard Times?